proportions of the golden mean and symbolizes the union of heaven and earth. I mean, what modern building can claim as much? Sounds great, but I'd like to hear a few more specifics. Well, I think the ancients saw length, and length as achievable by using contextualism and both length and measure as the basis for multivalence. These are both terms for design principles. That's very specific. Now, what are you talking about? Okay, definition of terms. Contextualism means looking at buildings and objects as parts of a whole, not having full meaning unless seen in context. And multivalence refers to a lot of information being communicated by various means, all in one composition. The result is so rich that you can read a lot into it, regardless of whether you can fully interpret it. Well, what do they want to communicate about the world that's different from the way we feel? Well, today people tend to see human life as an accident in a random order. The ancients saw creation as perfect with themselves at the center, the midpoint on a scale from the atom to the cosmos, with each level related to all the others. Maybe they weren't so far off about the scale part, because we now know that the human body is the mean in the ratio between the dimensions of the sun and an atom. All right, well, what'd they do when all this was figured out? Well, they tried to perfect the part of the scale that referred to themselves, that part of nature which relates to the human scale. If you can bear with me, I'll give you a quote from Plato, which I think sums it up. Quote, perhaps there's a pattern set up in the heavens for one who desires to see it, and having seen it, to found one in, in himself. Just to pull this together now, the ancients saw themselves in the middle of a scale that went from the atomic to the cosmic. As the universe had many scales, so did they. Man was made up of a lot of elements, just as the universe was. You're losing me, but go on. Well, I'll put it another way. The ancients thought that they had traces of the gods in them. These gods were also all around them in the landscape. And when a god did something, it affected the corresponding parts in humans. Okay, I see that, but how does it fit in? Well, in order to use this situation to their advantage, the ancients had to predict the events of the physical world so they could plan appropriate responses. So because these forces affected them, the ancients want to know about them beforehand so they could get ready? Well, more or less. All right, so what were these forces? Well, the most important seemed to be the forces which acted through the two spheres of light, the light of the sun and the nighttime light of the moon, stars, and planets. Whatever came above the horizon could affect them. The important point to get is that ancient man created a worldview which was based on actual experience. Today, our view is really an, an abstraction. But isn't that all a bit far-fetched? I mean, stars affecting behavior? Well, let me put it like this. There is a measurable physical change when the sun comes above the horizon, not just in light and heat, but in the electromagnetic balance in the atmosphere. The moon's gravitational pull is responsible for tides on Earth, and sunspots interfere with radio transmissions. Maybe we can rationalize all this in nice scientific terms, but in times gone by it was a magic to be reckoned with. They built it into their world view. As a background, then, to looking at the ancients' built forms, they felt they were affected by both the solar and terrestrial environments. They built solar observatories, such as Stonehenge, and tried to harness energy in the terrestrial environment by channeling it into certain routes, like ley lines in Britain and dragon lines in China. Well, what does that all have to do with length and measurement? Well, in their construction, they used units of measurement which related time, cosmic distances, and the human body by numbers common to them all. Oh. Or you could say that their units of measure referred to natural constants on more than one scale. People like John Mitchell have traced the origins of these numbers. One example, the Egyptian royal cubit, used widely in their early building, is the distance from the elbow to the shoulder. The cubit, in turn, is geometrically related to the megalithic yard. The megalithic yard corresponds to the ratio between the dimensions of the Earth and the Moon. So we have the human body linked to the cosmos. Impressive, kind of. How many units were there altogether? Well, basically five. The inch, foot, yard, megalithic yard, and Egyptian cubit. These are all common to the examples I want to talk about today. OK, so I see how length and measure fit in. But what about those design things you mentioned? Contextual and multivalence. Well, I want to look 
First, at two examples of contextualism, ley lines in Britain and dragon lines in China. Next, to look at Stonehenge, Glastonbury, uh, Glastonbury Abbey, and the Great Pyramid as examples of multivalence. Contextualism? Li what lines? That's contextualism, Keith, and they use this to achieve length. The lines refers to imaginary routes along which energy was supposed to have flowed. But this really needs a context. Imagine a situation where you are faced with a largely unaltered, natural landscape, not fraught with modern complexities. You want to do something with the landscape. Why? Well, why indeed? Because energy seemed to be flaring out from various parts of the landscape in a haphazard way and creating problems like crop failures and natural disasters. So the ancients wanted, naturally, to control it. Sounds good. Let's look first at the British example. Problem. Limited building skills and resources in a vast area to bring under control. The response. Rather than attempting to make long structures like canals were to another situation, smaller individual buildings and objects connected with worship were placed along imaginary straight lines to encourage energy flow along predictable paths. The individual buildings and objects marking the route were connected by virtue of their geographical alignment. The desired result was to harness energy into these lay lines. Why'd they want to harness that energy? I mean, it all sounds pretty obscure. Well, most importantly, if they could get a proper energy flow into an area, it would ensure the fertility of crops. So they stuck these lines around the countryside? Well, not at random. They had a rationale. Ley lines were placed specifically where they could pick up energy currents from their sources. These were the currents which at various times of the year were charged with fertilizing potential, courtesy of the heavens. How did they know there was energy flowing? The ancients thought that mountains were sacred because they seemed so life-giving, being the apparent source of rivers, rain, and wind. So with the emphasis on fertility, and because mountains and high hills seemed obvious energy sources, ley lines were usually set out to connect two such high points. All right. Once you figured out where this cosmic fertilizer flowed from, how did the man in the street tell where it was going? Well, obviously, ley lines had to be visible by both gods and man. Let's take a hypothetical example. The desired route is first determined. Initially, the sacred objects are placed, stone groupings for ritual ceremonies, sacrificial stones and sacred ceremonial and burial mounds, for example. Then subtle alterations to the landscape to further mark the route, hollowed out roads through trees, notches in high hills, paths etched into steep slopes, trees planted on sacred mounds. Much later, the ley lines were further reinforced. The early Christians had a policy of building on top of pagan worship spots, Abbeys, churches, and monasteries were set into an already established pattern. Well, how'd they know the lines were straight if, if, as you say, they were miles long? Don't tell me they had survey equipment. Well, of a type, they did. They used fire. In order to get the fertility forces moving, once a year they had a ceremony to try to set the process in motion. In this ritual, beacon fires were lit and reflecting points such as artificial ponds, banked streams, and moats around mon mounds were set up to relay the light. So the accuracy was checked annually. Well, what do these ley lines tell us about how people thought of the world? Overriding all else was the view that creation was perfect. But you have to account for how things go wrong within a perfect system. So they felt that within this perfect creation, there were two great and opposite forces, known alternately as good and bad, negative and positive, light and dark, heaven and earth. The dichotomy was often symbolized by the circle and the square. Relating this to ley lines, these lines represented a go-between for the heavenly terrestrial dichotomy. The power came from the heavens, but in order to use it effectively on earth, man had to intervene. So if crops failed or natural disasters occurred within this perfect creation, the people obviously weren't doing things right. So if humans didn't do their part to resolve the forces and one of them got out of hand, you could have a mess. Well, you could indeed. <coughs> now let's look at how the Chinese handled the same situation. 
Faced with a similarly blank landscape, they set up a different energy system and took the principle of contextualism to a more refined level. The ancient oriental version of ley lines were called lang mei, or dragon lines. In the British situation, the points marking the route of the lines had been the primary design focus. In China, however, the lines were accommodated by altering the surrounding landscape. The lines weren't defined by points, but by the shape of the land. So length was still achieved by applying contextualism. You're fading slightly. First, did the Chinese have the same worldview as the British? Well, no, not exactly. They, they shared the idea of the two great and opposite forces that had to be resolved. But instead of having one in the heavens and one on earth, they had them both down here. They described their two forces as yin and yang, or positive and negative, male and female. They were both present in the landscape as powerful currents, called dragon currents. The yang currents, male, destructive, dark, were to be found in sharp rocks and peaks, strongest in steep mountain routes. Yin currents, on the other hand, female, gentle, light, were found in a gentle, softly undulating landscape and were strongest in a chain of low hills. Second question, how did they tap their version of cosmic energy differently? Well, to answer you, I first have to explain that the ancient Chinese believed that beauty, along with the structure of the universe, could be represented in numbers. They tapped the energy of the dragon current, currents by using these numbers to manipulate the landscape. To have the correct proportion of energy, any given area had to have clearly defined yin and yang features to the proportions of three-fifths yang and two-fifths yin. So yang gives the brute force and yin, yin cools it down to make it manageable? Well, more or less, yes. Did they have the same hang-up with long straight lines? Yes, but not applied in the same way. The major dragon lines ran across the country in straight lines. Locally, the landscape was altered to drain some of this energy off. To accomplish this channeling of energy, they cut off mountain tops, <laughs> smoothed out hills to slope gently, built lakes and so on. Well, how did buildings fit into this? They were placed to be in areas of <laughs> balanced yin and yang. Forces, still part of the system, but <laughs> not used to mark the root of the current, only complementary to it. As well, parts of the built environment could be conductors. Artificial long lines could be dangerous if not handled carefully. Long straight lines, such as railways and canals, could drain positive energy or feed negative energy into an area. So, for example, eaves along roofs were often broken up as a safeguard. In the English situ situation, you imply that a network of lines eventually crossed the whole country. How great an effect did the use of dragon lines have on China? Well, all of China, south of the Great Wall, was conceived as a single design. Parts of the landscape were altered to give the desired pattern of energy flow. For example, towns were often placed on the south slope of an artificial hill to give shelter from unfavorable influences from the north. Example? Well, without doubt, the most impressive is Coal Hill, north of Peking. The hill was man-made and lies on the main axis of the city. The emperor used to climb up once a year to check things out. He made a ritual survey of the axis to make sure the energy was on target. The entire complex of the imperial city was on an axis, which then continued into the main streets of the surrounding city and then for miles into the countryside. This carefully arranged axis directed energy to the emperor as the mediary between the gods and his subjects. In comparing dragon lines and ley lines, they were both in response to a view of creation that included two great and opposite forces to be resolved. And contextualism was one design tool for achieving the harnessing of these forces with a minimum of manpower and capital. What about multi-vigilance? Multivalence, Keith. Yes, well, I want to look at three examples. You'll remember this term, multivalence, refers to a wealth of information being conveyed by various means, all within one composition, with a resulting richness that lends itself to many levels of interpretation. Right. Shirley Stonehenge is one of the best examples of this. During the last decade or so, people have claimed to have evidence that it was everything from a virgin sacrificial temple to a landing site for spacecraft. 
so much information seems to have been built into the structure that people feel compelled to put labels on it. Herein lies the basis for terming it multivalent. Well, how did this information get built in? Well, Stonehenge can be seen as a geometric structure consisting of figures relating to each other in proportion and through numbers. The builders took their idea of a perfectly ordered creation and reduced it to a tangible set of numbers, which were in turn used to design Stonehenge. So because it symbolically represented the cosmos, it became a tool for relating the known material world to the unseen forces acting on it. Do you think it was for virgins or spaceships? <laughs> Hardly either, Keith. More plausibly, people like Hawkins in his book, Stonehenge Decoded, have shown that the geometric layout is related to the sun. He explained how the various stones <laughs> could be used to cite key astronomical events and predict cycles and eclipses of the sun. It was a simple observatory. So what does it have to say for itself? To understand it further, you first have to look at their numerical representation of the universe that I mentioned. Today, these types of representations are called magic squares because of their unique mathematical properties. There are blocks of numbers which, to point out one characteristic, produce the same sum for rows added in any direction. By its properties, the square refers to patterns of regular natural growth and the idea of various levels of order, the ancients' concept of creation. Tell me exactly what this square does. Well, take the square which represents the sun, the one which Stonehenge refers to. A row in any direction adds up to the same number. Any symmetrical block of four numbers adds to the number 74. The megalithic yard, when squared, also equals 74. And the megalithic yard is prominent in a number of structures, including Stonehenge, which make reference to the sun. Tell me exactly how this box fits in with the stones. Just to take a few examples, the earliest structure at Stonehenge is the perimeter bank of Earth with a circumference of 370 megalithic yards. The sum of the perimeter numbers on the sun square is 370. A hexagon drawn within a circle with circumference 370 megalithic yards has an area of 66,600 square feet or 7,400 square yards. The sum of the sun square equals 666. A circle constructed within that hexagon corresponds to the Aubrey holes. Two equilateral triangles contained within the larger circle measure 277.5 feet on each side. 2,775 is the sum of the numbers of 1 to 74. All right, aside from all these numbers, what about its more symbolic function? Well, on a different level, Stonehenge is symbolic of the union of the two great forces within creation, as represented by the circle and square. It symbolizes this union in its geometry. The outer Sarsen circle measures 316.8 feet around. If it is re rearranged to form a square with the same perimeter, this square exactly contains the blue stone circle. And all, all these things make it multivalent. The Stonehenge was conceived as a place of worship, as a single solar observatory with an expression of the numbers of the, in the sun square and as symbolic of the union of heaven and earth. Okay, I get the picture. Now let's switch to look at the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey, one of, once one of the most impressive religious monuments in Britain. It, too, exhibits a complexity of communication which suggests multivalence. I'm ready. Well, as the story goes, the original church was a small, simple structure. In the 8th century, a great abbey church was built on the site. This was destroyed, however, by fire in uh, 1184 and was rebuilt on the same foundations. The ground plan of the chapel of St. Mary is supposed to have preserved the dimensions of the first, more simple structure. So what do these runes have to say? Well, a circle containing the four corner points of the chapel has a diameter of 79.2 feet. The earth has a diameter of 7,920 miles. A circle of diameter 79.2 feet has an area of 666 square megalithic yards. 
666 is the sum of the numbers in the sun square. Here again is this symbolic union of the heavenly terrestrial duality in this joining of the circle and the square. The whole of the complex at Glastonbury is contained within a 74-foot grid of 36 squares. The resulting rectangle has one side measuring 666 feet. Both 74 and 666 are numbers that relate to the sun square. If you take the 6 by 6 sun square and give each face a dimension of 6 megalithic yards, the area of the resulting shape is 266.4 square feet. The abbey is contained within a rectangle of area 26,640 square megalithic yards. Much more work has been done recently, notably by Keith Critchlow on decoding the language of Glastonbury. I see what you're aiming at, and all this points to multivalence, right? Yes, and in justifying this, I would point out that the ruins at Glastonbury give evidence of a cruciform plan embodying the Christian symbol of the cross. It represents the heavenly terrestrial union by the geometric resolving of the circle and the square. And finally, the geometry which uses the sun square's numbers and the location itself indicates that it was conceived as a spiritual successor to Stonehenge. Now, that's a little hard to swallow. Yes, well, if you view Glastonbury and Stonehenge together, they seem to be related by the principle of contextualism in that they appear to play off one against the other. If you extend the main axis of the abbey, it passes through several points of religious significance and terminates in Stonehenge. And they both use numbers which seem to relate to the sun square. Obviously, they were built for different reasons, but by viewing them together, each takes on an added richness. Uh -huh. Well, the last example I want to look at is the Great Pyramid, which is part of a complex built in Egypt between 2723 and 2563 BC. Doesn't it have something to do with facing the four directions? Well, this, of course, is its most obvious feature. The four faces of the Great Pyramid indeed look to the four points of the compass. And it stands in a spot that the ancient Egyptians thought was the center of the earth. These two alignments indicate an attempt to express the perfection of man's part of the cosmos. More importantly, though, it is symbolic of the union of, the, of opposites, the union of heavenly and terrestrial forces by which crops were thought to be fertilized. More circles and squares? You are catching on quickly. The perimeter of the base of the pyramid is 1,760 Egyptian cubits, and its height, 280. A circle with a radius 280 cubits has a circumference of 1,760 cubits. And with an angle of 51 degrees 51 minutes, the height multiplied by 2 pi is equal to the perimeter of the base. If you geometrically reduce the dimensions of the pyramid, you find that a side of the base and the height are in a ratio of 8 to 5. This proportion as you know, is, is known as the golden mean, once thought to be the perfect proportion. Its use would seem to further reflect the ancient's idea of a perfect creation. Let's have something a little funkier. Well, how about this? In 1632, Galileo hypothesized that the number 220 was the multiple by which the diameter of the Earth's orbit is greater than the diameter of the Sun. Using this figure, he deduced that the Earth's orbit was 10,648,000 times bigger than the Sun's diameter. If you generate a rectangle from the pyramid with all but the presently missing tip, which was probably of a different material, the capacity is 53,240,000 cubic cubits. Now take the figure 5, which is the number of faces on a tetrahedron, and the height of the pyramid in great cubits. <coughs> Divide 53,240,000 by 5, and you get Galileo's number of 10,648,000. One could be led to speculate that this structure was a numerical expression of the Earth's place in the universe. Well, that's pretty funky. <laughs> Thank you. Now, just to recap and get a view of how the Great Pyramid is multivalent. 
it can be read as a monument to the king, recognizing him as the center of the society. His monument with him in the middle of it uh, was at the center of the earth as they saw it, with one face looking to each of the four quadrants of creation. On another level, it symbolizes the union of the two opposite forces which combined to provide fertility for crops. Another aspect of its geometry was used to express the relationship of the earth to the cosmos, and particularly to the sun. So now that's the lot. Yes, indeed. Well, let's have a summary in one sentence of your entire argument. One sentence. Length and measure weren't used for their own sake, but to give expression to the ancient's worldview, and in so doing, they applied length as long lines across the landscape and manipulated it as a language in their buildings. And now, just to uh, recap... Uh, that's it. You've been at it long enough. Thank you, Keith. I like the way that faded out. <laughs>